Welcome to Conversations. Today we have uh, with us a very distinguished ambassador, scholar, policymaker, and intellectual with us. We have Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed uh, with us, who joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1974, has worked and helped uh, and promoted India's interests abroad, especially in the Middle East. He has served as a distinguished ambassador to Saudi Arabia twice. He was ambassador to Oman and to the United Arab Emirates. He's also served uh, in important postings such as uh, New York. And after his retirement, he has worked as an executive in the Middle East and also as a policy thinker with think tanks. He's associated with one of the most important and influential think tanks in India, the ORF. But he has also become a scholar and he has written four books uh, and his most uh, uh, a recent book is about the Middle East, uh, and we will talk about it. And uh, during the course of this interview, I will uh, you can watch on the side all the books that he has written, some of the articles that I think you should read. And in the description uh, of this video, I will post a link uh, to, to, to the books uh, so that you can get them from Amazon.com. Uh, and for those of you who are here for the first time, uh, uh, on conversations, uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like the video, you know the drill, uh, ring the bell icon, uh, and also share it with your friends and your political network. Uh, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed, welcome to Conversations. Salaam alaikum, sir. Thank you very much. Sir, you have served as ambassador to perhaps one of the most uh, interesting and uh, powerful countries in the world, Saudi Arabia, not many people think of it as uh, a, a powerful country. I remember meeting King Abdullah once and he told me that nobody thinks of us as a superpower, but we are an economic superpower. And I, I found that uh, perspective very interesting. So my first question to you is about this particular development, uh, Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman was expected to stop in India on the way to Bali uh, for the G20 summit. And uh, he made his excuses and he did not arrive. And then a month later, we find uh, President Xi Jinping of China making a grandiose royal visit to Riyadh and 34 new agreements. And it suddenly appeared that Saudi Arabia has now become, if all those agreements are realized and acted upon, Saudi Arabia will very much be within the orbit of China uh, moving out of the orbit of the United States. So in the context of Xi Jinping's visit to Saudi Arabia and the earlier uh, hard work that the Indian Foreign Service has been doing to cultivate and develop uh, India's relations with Saudi Arabia, how do you see the evolving uh, foreign policy of Saudi Arabia with regards to India, US, and China? My understanding is that there is no uh, zero sum scenario here. India has <clears throat> its own value as far as the region is concerned. Our ties go back several thousand years. They have been constantly nourished. And we have a eight and a half million strong community that lives there. A majority, uh, the largest expatriate community in every country of the GCC and also the majority country in three a community in three countries. UAE, Qatar, and Bahrain. China has its own significance and value. It is not in competition with India because India's approach to the region, which I have constantly said, is transactional and bilateral. We do not take a region-wide approach. Our uh, diplomacy is conservative. It is based on mutual interest with individual countries. This served us well. Uh, we have got substantial ties with Iran, with Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE, etc. I have been a critic of this approach for many years now because I believe that the era of uh, transactional approaches and bilateral approaches is over. China has a very different approach. China has, to, uh, for want of a better word, a strategic approach. It has a substantial region-wide approach. It also has a long-term perspective. And therefore, it uh, uh, it has uh, it had three summits in Riyadh, a bilateral summit. It had a summit with the GCC leader and had an Arab League summit, and has made it very clear that it views the region as an integrated entity with which it seeks to partner. 
What it brings to individual countries may be separate. It will provide a logistical connectivity here, an investment somewhere else, a kind of joint venture elsewhere, a major project, nuclear technology, what have you. But its perspective is a region-wide perspective. And it doesn't, uh, and it has uh, also relations with Iran, it has relations with Israel, but this particular visit highlighted that China now is going to be a significant competitor as far as the U.S. is concerned. And this is going, this is the main message that has come from this visit. Well, I understand very clearly that uh, as the United States slowly withdraws from the Middle East for, for various reasons, it's creating a power vacuum there and China is clearly moving into this. But there's also this development of what we call, what is known as the I2U2, uh, a kind of a mini lateralism, India and Israel, and U2 is United Arab Emirates and USA. Three of them are actually nuclear powers, <laughs> uh, except for <laughs> UAE. I think of it as three elephants with a mouse. Uh, they seem to have formed a caravan. And uh, Saudi Arabia is not part of I2U2, and Saudi Arabia has not yet signed the Abrahamic Accords. So how do you see that minilateral approach approaching? Because it seems to me that the United States is kind of, uh, for the lack of a better word, uh, developing a, a web of networks in which India is now getting involved with the US, whether it is the Quad, whether it's I2U2, uh, so with this emergence of I2U2, do you think that it could become some sort of a competitor uh, with China and Saudi Arabia in that region and also in some ways extracting UAE out of the Middle East and bringing it into the orbit of uh, the United States? Uh, so instead of the U.S. going to the Middle East, it's taking what it wants from the Middle East. My understanding is a little different. In the context of the rise of China and the challenge that China poses to American interests, particularly in the West Pacific, there has been a scramble for initiatives from China. You will recall 10 years ago, Hillary Clinton has spoken of a pivot to the East at the expense of West Asia. Not much happened. There is not really anything significant. But what did occur is in 2017, uh, a decision was taken to not only revive the Moribund Quad, but to make it a, a security-based coalition after consolidating the concept of the so-called Indo-Pacific, an Indo-Pacific that would bring India into this orbit. But I want to also, and it went quite far. It not only started at a ministerial level, it then escalated and went into the summit level. And then it withered away. This is something which many have missed, that it was earlier a robust security coalition. But as the Chinese, and this is my argument several at several platforms, that as the Indian relationship with the United States got consolidated and given a substantial value, the Chinese moved their troops to Ladakh. 2019, we have the ministerial, April 2020, the Chinese counter with Ladakh. What they are reminding India, and anyone who wishes to hear, that India's principal interests lie right here at the border, not in the West Pacific, not in the South China Sea. And immediately, within a year of that, there has been a course correction and a robust security coalition that was taking shape in the, uh, in the form of the Quad has now gone away and in September 2021, you find that its priorities are uh, pandemic cooperation, technology cooperation, climate change, etc., for which there are other platforms. It is in this background that you must see the so-called I2. I attach no strategic value to this gathering. It is a gathering of people, uh, miscellaneous people, come on board in a certain context, and uh, as far as the U.S. and Israel is uh, concerned, they have uh, already a very substantial relationship. The UAE is struggling for a certain place. You know, it has the small country syndrome. Uh, they want to be punching above their league. They, uh, they want to follow in the footsteps of Qatar. 
and want to become a major role player in regional affairs and in this way consolidate their value as far as the Americans are concerned. I have been a skeptic as far as I2U2 is concerned, pointing out that there is nothing, there is no strategic consensus within this grouping, that it is just a dialogue platform. People get together. People have talked about economic cooperation. And I said economic cooperation is not done by government, it's done by, com uh, it's done by companies. And if companies want to cooperate with each other, they don't need I2U2. So I'm a skeptic there and I remain a skeptic. I do not believe that these other groupings have any... Uh, uh, this is a period of churn, a world order that is, go is going through significant changes for a whole variety of reasons that we can discuss separately. But the main point is that all of us are, as the old order, the US led, or you can call it unipolar moment, or the American hegemonic order, whatever, as it declines. It is not that the Americans are disengaging from anywhere. It is that the others are engaging more robustly in support of their interests. Both the countries of the region itself in West Asia, as well as other players, are now taking initiatives which are independent of any American role or interest. It is the U.S. that is floundering for a policy approach. It is not that the others are, cha others are, uh, uh, you know, they are distancing themselves from the American. They are not. America has a certain value as far as the region is concerned, and indeed many other players. What they are challenging is U.S. monopoly over the security issues of the region, bringing in other interests, and also agitating for their own role as far as regional affairs is concerned. So this is the churn that we are witnessing. You have seen the engagement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, five rounds. They have stalled for the moment, but they will be picked up. You have seen also Turkey's outreach to Saudi Arabia, UAE and Egypt. And you have seen uh, a lot of activity taking place. Uh, Egypt talking to the Iranians, Turkey talking to various other players, also reopening to the Israelis, etc. There are many uncertainty certainly for example we don't know which way the israelis are likely to go you have an extreme right wing government that flies in the face of every other development that is happening in the region you have they have taken several steps backward we don't know which way they will go you recall the previous government it had engaged with the region and we were hopeful that this engagement with the arab positive substantial constructive would over a period of time create a sea change in the mindset of certain sections of Israeli population and the kind of visceral animosity that many Israelis have, some of it bordering on, uh, on racism, if that an extreme religious affiliation, some of that would get diluted over a period of time. So I would imagine that the present government that is emerging in Tel Aviv will take many steps backward, but I think that its days are numbered and that Israel, over a period of time, will take a fresh look at the region. All the others have. Look at Saudi Arabia. It is not the country that you knew five years ago. Look at uh, uh, you know, Iran is under challenge. Turkey is also facing challenge. So all the countries are facing challenges to the traditional order and are already in a churn, creating new engagements, new alignment, and pursuing new opportunities. Yes, I mean, uh, that's clear that, that the old order is uh, is collapsing or at least receding and we don't know what is coming uh, uh, or is on the other side of the tunnel. And so people are grasping. And, and so some of these new alignments are indicative of people's search uh, to, to find a new meaning. I want to talk a little bit more about your view on this Indo-Pacific. So on one hand, uh, there was an exchange that uh, uh, the External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar had with somebody on a recent forum where he was asked that Americans think of uh, whether Indo-Pacific was uh, a, a strategic alliance or was it Red Cross? And and uh, Jay Shankar has always gave a very good answer. He said, first of all, you're underestimating the Red Cross. But he very clearly said that it was never intended to be just a strategic thing. And these other issues are critical, such as COVID. So from the very beginning, the U.S. has seen uh, the Quad as a strategic alliance, as a 
as a defense partnership, uh, trying to contain China, whereas India has always uh, tried to maintain that, no, it's a dialogue, it's not uh, an alliance. But the current U.S. defense budget, uh, it, it, it has amazing, interesting items about, in fact, talking, weaning the India of the Russian technology, bringing it into the U.S. technological uh, ambit, uh, and also talking about training Indians, uh, Indian leaders on defense. So I think it's from a U.S. perspective, the Quad is still a strategic thing. From the Indian perspective, it is still uh, a dialogue. But the the recent uh, war games that India and and the U.S. had uh, uh, called Yudh Abhyas, which were then immediately followed by China's reincursion uh, in Assam. So, so do you think that uh, this is really China's way of saying that? Uh, you should stay in Asia rather than trying to aspire to become a Western country. In fact, Jayashankar did say that uh, this cannot be an Asian century with uh, India and China not on the same page together. Uh, I would look at the region from actually the whole security landscape is integrated. You know, the kind of uh, luxury we had earlier of looking at the regions separately and focusing on separate geographical spaces, that era is gone. Everything impinges on something else as well. But if we just look at the so-called Indo-Pacific, Indo-Pacific is an artificial construct. It was created largely by the Americans to bring India into the security scenario. India was a reluctant partner and was very, it was groping for its role, which is why you get very strange remarks coming from New Delhi dialogue platform. Dialogue platform goes from joint secretary level, middle bureaucratic level, abruptly to minister level, and then goes to summit level, and then is scaled back and focuses on various other issues. The security content has, I think, been seriously diminished. Yes, you have exercises. You have exercises all the time nowadays. Maritime uh, engagements. Uh, Pakistanis have led a very major exercise. Russians and Chinese have done exercises with various people. India is doing exercises with Gulf countries, etc. Uh, I think there is an, an area of uncertainty. What the Americans are looking at is to create a, a sense of confrontation with China and center it around Taiwan more or less like what they had done with Savi, the Russians, in Ukraine. So there is this scenario which is emerging in Taiwan and this hype relating to Taiwan. Will there be an invasion and all that? And uh, also encouraging certain elements within Taiwan to, to use rhetoric uh, that they had not used before, indicating a certain uh, uh, approach towards independence. I think much of that has now withered away. India's approach is, as part of broad strategic autonomy, uh, to engage with as many people as possible and to gain certain advantages for itself. And I would say that, yes, it is in this broad context that we are engaging with the Americans. We have interoperability agreements with them. We feel that this is helping our own capacity expansion and uh, with uh, broadening the experience base of our people, learning from various others and teaching them about some of our own concerns. But the fact remains that India cannot and should not be a player in the, a coalition against China. We have a 4,000 kilometer border with China, which has been undemar which is undemarcated. Neither China nor India would like to see a conflictual scenario. Both of us are looking at expanding our economic base, and becoming significant players in the global economic scenario and also uh, helping the rise of our own people. That is our priority, not conflict, not war. Even if we were to think of war, do you think that this any war can settle the border issue? Not at all. It will have to be settled at some time politically between the governments of the two countries. It's a carryover from another era. It remains unresolved and we have to address it. India cannot also affiliate itself with any alliance, any security alliance, certainly not with a West-led security alliance. Therefore, constantly our leaders are talking about strategic autonomy. It remains in play. Initially, the Americans were uncomfortable with it. The Americans have a very narrow view 
of uh, world affair are you with us or against us this was with them in 1948 and it remains with them today it's a very narrow binary approach but countries are not like that countries say that we value you as a partner and friend but don't ask us to become somebody else's enemy look at their approach to iran for example that they not only have sanctions on iran largely due to domestic considerations, but every other country in the world has to follow suit. I mean, this makes no sense at all. We talk of energy problems in the world. Today, I would say to you very frankly, that the US-led sanctions on Iran and Venezuela deprived the international community of huge energy resources that are available right there in front of us, only to subserve American domestic interests. Therefore, if you want to blame somebody for an energy crisis, you have a villain right there in front of you. So I, I am a critic of the American approach, largely because it is thoughtless. It has no long-term perspective. It subserves domestic interests. It is constantly in an electoral mode. And its domestic lobbies and pressure groups and pressure groups are the ones that determine its approach to various. And there is no continuity. Countries are fed up with this. Today, what, why you see this churn in West Asia, and you are also seeing this churn in, 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 in Southeast Asia, nobody wants to participate in a binary divide. You have seen not a single country in West Asia has supported the Americans against Russia in terms of sanctions. ASEAN also has followed in the same way. Therefore, you will find that the global consensus really is to work towards peace and cooperation rather than provocation. I'm not here to discuss the uh, background of the Ukraine war. We have various reasons. Sure. We all know what the facts of life are. The point is that we need the Americans to now accept that its hegemony is over. There is a new order right there. It is a multipolar order and it is something where every country's interests have to be respected. I have read an article recently in Foreign Affairs where it has quoted an American scholar, uh, American national security advisor, as speaking of uh, strategic narcissism that animates American policy. And I believe that, that that is the way they do. Are you with us or are you against us? You know, I, I teach American foreign policy and, and I've been doing that for now two decades. And I teach it not just to my students, but I also teach to scholars from all over the world. And uh, I also <coughs> teach it to American diplomats. And let me tell you that even those who are in the foreign service are often perplexed uh, by some of the decisions that we make. Uh, it is just that because we have so much resources that the mistakes that we make are glossed over. The foreign policy errors that we make are hidden because of the, the huge advantage of resources we had. But now with the reducing gap, with other countries, uh, resource gap. I think uh, uh, the U.S. Um, you know, we 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 have less and less uh, margin of error, so we cannot uh, like uh, like our policy in Afghanistan was is um, quite a disaster. The way we got out of it, and we completely failed in Iraq and to, or to transform the Middle East. Uh, I want to talk to you about um, about this case with Nupur Sharma that happened. Uh, this BJP spokesperson who later we, we were told is a fringe element, but she was a national spokesperson who insulted uh, our uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the reaction from Saudi Arabia and other countries in the Middle East, while they did put pressure on India, and I, I consider it as, as one of the most important events uh, in Indian foreign policy for 2022, but I also am critical in the way they responded. The message they sent seem to have sent to India was do whatever you want to your Muslim minorities. We don't care. We will not say anything, but don't insult uh, the prophet of Islam. Then, then it's uh, unacceptable because there have been calls for genocide from Dharm, Dharm Sansad and other places uh, and uh, Indian Muslims at least feel that they are under siege. Their mosques are being converted into temples. Women are being... Uh, expelled from schools for trying to wear hijab. So there is this whole litany of complaints that Indian Muslims have, but the Muslim countries so-called, including OIC, uh, are not concerned about that, but they're just concerned about one random remark made on some television show by a fringe element of the ruling party. How do you see this, uh, This this like, you, you must have had lots of dialogues with 
policymakers in Saudi Arabia, Oman, UAE, where you served, is it just the principle of non-intervention in domestic politics with this UN principle? Because they spend a lot of money giving to Islamic activities, including in India, that is an intervention into domestic society. But why silent on this issue? Uh, let me clarify. The countries of the Gulf and indeed of West Asia in general do not wish to get involved with commentary on what is happening internally in other countries. Because that opens a Pandora's box where they themselves are concerned. Yes. They would like to completely separate this. They prefer foreign policy engagements to have a firewall as far as the domestic situation is concerned. Each of us has certain things happening at home. And the last thing we want is the international community agitating over this. The United States talks a lot about human rights concerns, freedom of faith, etc. But its own record is so murky that nobody takes the U.S. very seriously. So, uh, you know, this is what happens. Now, in the case of India, we have now a very clear pattern of approach as far as the government is concerned. We have a government that is totally committed to reinventing the idea of India that was accepted consensually in 1947-50. Between our independence and the promulgation of the constitution, a certain idea of India was consensually accepted. It was preceded by considerable debate within the country when it was under British rule about what kind of India would emerge. It was a very sharp debate all through the 19th century and much of the 20th century. There was also a British-sponsored communal divide politically within the freedom movement. And we saw that with regard to the sponsorship of the Muslim League and the support for the Pakistan project. Despite that, the stalwarts of our country, of all uh, political uh, perceptions, accepted a certain idea of India, an idea that was democratic, secular, and provided freedom on the one hand and equality of status and opportunity. It was, it was a secular order that respected faiths, did not reject faith, respected faith. Therefore, it was a little different from the French approach. That, 100 years later, is being reinvestigated. Now, the, the, the consensus of 1950 is rejected as a Nerovian failure. And it is now said that there should have been an alternative idea. Of it. Therefore, to understand what is happening in India, one has to accept that the primary project, the most important project, as far as the leadership is concerned, is to now frame a new idea of India, an idea that is sensitive to and recognizes the status of the Hindu community. The Hindu community is very broadly defined. It is broadly defined because it embraces all the castes and it embraces Sikhs and Jains as well. It only and it is framed in terms of its identity by demonizing the Muslim community also broadly framed as the Muslim. So the Hindu versus the Muslim, this is the discord. All of us know that over the last thousand years, this communal divide, so sharp and so categorical, so clear, actually never existed. In India, we have never had a scenario where you had this cleavage. We never had a religious war in India where you had these zealots, Muslim zealots, banging away at Hindus. At the, after nearly 1,000 years of Muslim rule in India, in undivided India, on the eve of independence, the maximum that the Muslim population ever reached was 25%. After 1,000 years, which tells you that Indian rulers were not obsessed with faith. Indeed, many of them accommodated different aspects. But this is the approach today. And that is the priority. Every aspect, therefore, even foreign policy approaches are based on this uh, idea that we need to correct the error, the failure and the shortcoming of 1947-50. Now, this is given a certain 
liberty to spokespersons from the ruling party to make statements in public that are obnoxious and offensive. They are not based on any deep knowledge of history, of politics, of culture, of faith, doctrine, etc. It is a lewd remark because you have a sense of impunity. I can get away with anything I say. And hence, over a period of time, you've had rather irresponsible statements coming out from various sources. West Asia accommodated all this. They, their approach so far has been, whatever their personal views, their approach so far has been, look, this is your home. You handle matters. We are here to explore with you how we can expand our political and economic ties. Occasionally, this firewall is breached. And it's breached because of the remarks which were obnoxious, which were offensive as far as the Holy Prophet is concerned. The spokesperson had no clue. They are they talk about loosely about hadith, have no idea what is a hadith, no idea about the complex history of various hadiths, etc. They just say, Oh, this is a hadith, and this is part of Muslim doctrine, and the Prophet did this or this or that. Now the governments were slow to react. Do recall here. It took them eight to ten days after the public television. What happened is <clears throat> in this era of social media, yeah. these television sequences were sent. They bled into the region and finally reached the religious authorities. It is the religious authorities who are generally subservient to state order, as the, is traditional in uh, Islamic history. They agitated this issue. And the authoritarian rulers have to take cognizance of They don't want to. They wish it didn't happen. But if it happens, they have to be seen to be doing. So certain actions were taken. Certain uh, demarches were made. Ambassadors were summoned, etc. And it was hoped that this would be put away. It would go back. The government took certain actions, suspended the two spokespersons, etc. There is not enough enthusiasm on the part of West, West Asian government to get more deeply involved. Many have pointed out that what the Chinese have done with their Uyghur Muslim minority uh, has evoked no criticism as far as West Asia is concerned, except some loose remarks from Iran and Turkey, and even those have not been seriously pursued. Now, the question we ask ourselves, is this approach sustainable? As far as I can see, what has been happening in India over eight years has been treated as a domestic matter, not just by West Asia, even by Western countries. Each of them sees India as a valued partner. In fact, the priority, whether you are in Brussels or Berlin or Paris or in Washington, D.C., is to see how we can pull India into the Western orbit yeah. and accommodate India in the Western orbit. That is where we are. Ultimately, the problems relating to India and its domestic scenario will have to be settled within India. I do not expect any country uh, subordinating its strategic interest to caring for what is happening within the country. And I agree with that. I would not want too many people to be hammering away within the country uh, inside. But I did warn people that, look, some of these things, you, this firewall between what is happening at home and what implications it has abroad, sometimes it has the bad habit of coming home. For example, I warned that, look, what about employment? Employment of Indians in the Gulf is founded on the basis that Indians are apolitical, that do not involve with domestic politics and do not get involved with religious politics. On this basis, Indians are now the number one community in the region and the number one expatriate community in every country of the region and the majority community, as I mentioned earlier, in three countries. Why is this? It is because we come from a democratic and secular order. We were seen as a community that was safe, that did not get involved with domestic issues. But look at the obverse now. If Indians, sections of Indians, are viewed as affiliating themselves with a robust anti-Muslim platform. Recruitment that is done not by governments, but by individuals. Certain individuals may start wondering, 
am I doing the right thing in getting so many Indians in? Yeah. What if there is discord within my company? Can I afford that? Therefore, I have warned that it is, you must, you cannot pretend that what is happening at home will not over time have certain implications. And that is where I would say that we have to be alert. India's salvation in the broadest possible way, India's salvation in terms of its stature in the world, in terms of its future, in terms of its leadership in global affairs, all of it is founded on the unity of the country. The perception that India supports a certain value system that accommodates diverse people, that is sensitive to different people's interests. That is the basis on which we will go forward, not on the basis of demonizing certain sections, abusing them, carrying out violence against certain people, abusing them on a full time basis. I'm not bothered about West Asian approach. They have their own house to take care of. I have mine. But I am saying that if India has a role to play in world affairs, it has to it has to project a seriously unified approach within the country, an inclusive approach. If we talk about inclusivity in foreign affairs, you have to be inclusive at home. Yes. And that is where I would say that that is where we have to have our priorities right. You know, the Prime Minister, while talking about the G20 forum, said our, 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 our values are Vasudeva Kutumbakum, that we treat the whole world as a, fa as a family. I think uh, he should begin, uh, like, like all charities, that should also be at home. Uh, why not treat all Indians uh, as a family to begin with and, uh, and then move forward? Um, I mean, your, your answer was quite eloquent, uh, uh, Ambassador Ahmed. My last question to you is, there is a, 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 a euphoria uh, among uh, the policy elite in India and, and here also that India is rising. Uh, I recently interviewed uh, Senator Koons, who is an important player on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and he quoted Blinken as saying that U.S.-India relations are, in the opinion of the U.S. Uh, policymakers, the most consequential relations uh, of the world. India is now one of the most, if not the most important country that the West is courting uh, in the world. Uh, and next year, India is going to be uh, the president of G20, the presidency of SCO, just finished its term as a president of the UN Security Council, mm -hmm. in which it basically uh, made the case that India should become a permanent member of the UN Security Council. So given all of this uh, ascendance of India internationally, uh, I found the fact that India continued to buy Russian oil and make the case that this is in our national interest uh, as saying that it did appear a bit opportunistic indeed, didn't it? That, okay, we have an opportunity here to pursue our own self-interests rather. But India, do you think India has shown the global leadership that it is aspiring to in this entire uh, year especially in the context of the Ukraine war and India's role in supporting Russia? Is India playing the, the role of the global leader that India wants to play? There are many separate issues in play here. First, let's dispose of the American stroke European approach. This is robust flattery. It appeals to our ego, makes us feel good about ourselves. Certain of our sections are uh, very thrilled when Western leaders say nice things about us, glossing over many of the shortcomings. This is linked with this very robust approach to disengage India from strategic autonomy and pull it closer and closer to the Western alliance. I attach very little value to it. These same people will sing a different song if there is a different set of circumstances. It has emerged in the context of Ukraine. I would therefore... Uh, having uh, uh, having lived with Western countries for so long, having recognized what they are up to, I am not particularly impressed by what they have to say. And they, they sing different songs at different times and change their tune whenever it suits them. Now coming, what is India's core interest and how is it supposed to achieve it? Let us not get take, uh, uh, you know overwhelmed by this business of G20 and SEO. These are not gifts that have come to India. This is part of a routine rotational arrangement 
within the uh, entities of which we are members, you know, SCO and G20. Suddenly, you know, in India, of course, they are being projected as part of a singular achievement of the prime minister and of the country that he has led for eight or nine years. So that is a different domestic content because we are on the eve of it. We are constantly in election mode, as you must have observed. Yeah. And we have the national election in 2024. <clears throat> the ruling party does not take any election for granted. And it puts maximum effort to ensuring it wins. And its record as far as state elections is concerned is actually very poor. Almost most state elections, it has lost. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, they are constantly vulnerable. And that is because there are certain concerns that they have with regard to what have we actually achieved at home beyond rhetoric. But that is another matter that is for the economists to talk about. I'm not an economic scholar and I will not get into that. But I have concerns relating to national unity on which I can speak because I live over here and I've experienced it on a daily basis. Where are we going? This is my question to myself. Strategic autonomy is as much a mantra as is minilateralism, plurilateralism, etc., etc. It means, I would say, defining and understand, firstly, understanding of India's long, medium to long term interests, developing policies to achieve those interests, and at the same time, providing resources that would ensure that we are able to achieve what we have set out for. I have argued and I continue to do what India needs is a new strategic culture. 30 years ago, an American observer had said India has no strategic culture, that India's security related decision making is short term, defensive, ad hoc. And, uh, you know, and uh, I think that this pattern continues today. The churn in world order. And the challenges the world order has thrown up, political and economic, the rise of China being only one of them, the dismantling of U.S. hegemony, uh, the rise of multiple uh, multiplicity of role players in world affairs, churns in both the Indo-Pacific as well as in West Asia, new challenges in the Indian Ocean. All of these, to my mind, call for a very different approach, a new strategic culture. So I would say that all let us not subordinate our interest to rhetoric. Today you find we are suffused in rhetoric. Constantly we are told, you are told uh, you, you we hear rhetoric as if that is truth. But yeah. all of us who live here know what the truth is. Most observers who are familiar with India know what the truth is. And they seek to gloss over it because it doesn't suit their interest. I would go back to the I would go to the I believe in India. I believe in the future of India. I have for 40 years been a role player in promoting India's interest. Today I am an observer, but I am a commentator and indeed very frequently a critic. I believe a new foreign policy approach is required. What are the contents with regard to that? I don't, I'm, I'm not, I'm uncomfortable with words like strategic autonomy or non-alignment earlier, etc. What is the content? India can never be part of somebody else's alliance. We are too old, too large, too anarchic to be following somebody else's dicta. We rejected it in 1947. I can't see us accepting it 75 years later. Absent that, what we need is to really put our heads together to see what do we need to do domestically and in terms of foreign policy perspective that would actually uh, 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 that will actually achieve our interest. This is what the Chinese did. Many people don't like the model of China. 1979, Indian and Chinese economies were on par. Imagine in 1947-48, what a gap there was between India and China. 1979-1980, we were on par. Now China has got an economy which is five times bigger than ours. And it has gone way ahead. During this period, I point out to you, from 1980 onwards, when China was galloping forward with its uh, uh, with its rejuvenation and resurgence, India started focusing on identity politics at home. This is the same period 
say 1990, Deng Xiaoping going forward with his reform and we are destroying Ayodhya. We are going into communal riots. We are going into idea of India based on a certain narrower understanding of national identity and national priority. That is the problem. That 40 years, when I would call this four lost decades. So if I have to have a major role in world affairs, I must have my country at peace with itself at home. Without that, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not bothered about rhetoric. I'm not concerned about what Blinken has to say or what Biden has to say. They can look after their country. I have to look after mine. And I need a very united and strong country. I'm not getting there. I get the impression sometimes that the priority of the nation is to reinvent the idea of India. That is the priority. This is a golden opportunity perceived by them. And that is where they want to go. It doesn't matter. Everything else, every foreign policy engagement is subordinated to serving this grand vision of the future of India. I am uncomfortable with that grand vision. I believe objectively as a student of history, politics and diplomacy, I don't believe it will serve India's interest. I believe that India has to be, I'm not talking about Nehruvian other. I'm aware that we live in the 20th, 21st century. I believe that there is a churn in world affairs. I want a new strategic culture that is founded on a long-term understanding of India's interests and the deployment of resources that will achieve those interests. Ambassador Saab, uh, thank you very much for that rather eloquent conclusion. And I'm extremely, uh, you, have, you have thrown lots of interesting ideas and I would like to continue this dialogue in future and come back to you uh, again and again to discuss this. I do want to also uh, perhaps have one, one conversation just focused on 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 the vision of India that you have. Uh, but I, since this is our first discussion, I want to take this opportunity to thank you very much for your service uh, as a diplomat uh, to the country. And I also want to um, uh, thank you for being such an exemplary example for the rest of us to emulate. Uh, so, Dr. Uh, so Ambassador Ahmed, uh, thank you very much for being on Conversation. Those of you who have uh, found this discussion interesting, please subscribe to Conversations. Definitely leave your comments uh, and engage with us. I, I try to respond to as many as I can. Uh, and uh, I, I promise you that I will keep chasing uh, Ambassador Ahmed uh, not too often to trouble him, but to, to come back and talk about important events, especially as a G20 summit approaches next year and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and hopefully the end of the uh, the war between Russia and Ukraine. So thank you very much, sir. It was a pleasure to have. Thank you very much, Professor. It's wonderful to have been with you. Look forward to future engagements with you as well. Thank you.